Welcome to this talk about the Priory Estate in Kew, or as it should more properly be known, the Priory Park Estate in Kew, as that was what it was originally called. And what I'm going to talk about this evening is what happened later in the Victorian era when the developers moved in who built what we know as the Priory Estate today. Now, those of you who came to an earlier talk of our society uh, may recognise the picture in the background as being taken from the Panorama of the Thames, published in 1829. And this is, roughly speaking, the only approximately contemporaneous image that we have of what the Priory itself was supposed to look like. And I think it's, in fact, completely misleading, but it's quite a nice background image. Now, let's start by reminding ourselves of where the Priory Estate was and is. This is a map of Q made in 1771. It's actually part of the larger Richmond Manor map made by Richardson for the purposes of land tax and the manor's accounting and so forth. And you'll see that a lot of the properties here have got numbers on them, which link them, in fact, to the manorial records. And you see here the river going around the top of the peninsula with Kew Bridge on top left and Kew Green to the left of center. And then you'll probably see Q Pond here, and behind it, a series of fields with numbers on them, 822, 821, and so on and so forth. They, these are the fields that are going to be of interest to us. And in particular, those which have the name Levitt Blackball written on them. So who was Levitt Blackball? He was, in fact, the uh, grandson of Sir Richard Levitt, who was a rich tobacco merchant in the city, who owned a certain amount of property in Kew, including, it might be noted, the um, uh, what's known as the Dutch House, or as we know it now, Kew Palace. And when he died, this property passed to his eldest daughter, Mary, who had married an Abraham Blackbourne. In fact, Abraham Blackbourne was a business associate of Sir Richard Levitt. And Mary had two sons by Abraham Blackbourne, Levitt Blackbourne and Abraham. But uh, Abraham, uh, her, her husband, died while the children were quite young, and she remarried to a man called Robert Thurreton. And she went on, in fact, to have further children by Robert Thurreton. And when Mary died, the lands in Kew, which included the fields that I pointed out a moment ago, passed to Levitt Blackbourne. And then in turn, when he died in 1781, shortly after the map that I've shown you was made, they passed to his brother Abraham. And Abraham had no children, and so when he died in 1797, they passed into the Thurreton family. And by 1800 or so, they were probably in the hands of this man, Colonel Thomas Thurreton. Now, the Thurretons didn't live in Kew. They lived, in fact, in Nottinghamshire, where they had estates of their own. And as far as we know, they continued just to rent out these fields to tenant farmers. But in 1809, they evidently decided that they needed some money. And so what they were going to do was to sell their land holdings in Kew and uh, use the money on their estates in Nottinghamshire. And so they decided to put these uh, holdings up for auction, split up into 10 lots, in fact. And this is the auction bill from 1809, where these various fields to the east of Kew Green 
uh, were split up into separate lots and auctioned by Mr. Willock. Now, as it happens, we know that the first two of these lots were bought by a very wealthy uh, Catholic spinster called Elizabeth Doughty. And if we look a little closer, we see that what she got, she got lot one and lot two. She got a dwelling house situated on the east side of Kew Green with blah, 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 uh, to which was attached two fields, stone close and long close. And she also bought a second field, a close of rich meadow land called Barley Close. And the whole lot together came to about 13 acres or so. And very conveniently for us, someone from the Selwyn estate, uh, who were also important local landowners, was also bidding at this auction. And on the back of their copy of this auction bill, they very kindly wrote in the top left-hand corner who it was that got the various lots. And so they've written lot one, lot two, Elizabeth Doughty, for a total sum of £2,070, which, although it was quite a lot of money in those days, was in fact a drop in the ocean as far as she was concerned. And uh, they also note that, for example, William Selwyn got lot 10. But very usefully, down in the bottom left-hand corner here, they've noted that Thomas Thurton Esquire had squiggle in each meadow before sale of Willock. Now, I don't know what squ squiggle actually stands for, but this very conveniently confirms for us that these were indeed the fields that belonged to the Thuritons and that lots one and two went to Miss Elizabeth Doughty. So what did she get? She got, roughly speaking, what's in yellow on this slide. Uh, the three fields that I've mentioned, she also bought over the next couple of years some smaller adjoining plots of land um, to make up the totality of what became the Priory Estate. But notice that, for example, it didn't stretch as far as the river. The various fields on that side were owned and farmed by others. And the two large fields here, marked 825 and 826, coloured in blue, uh, were not part of what Miss Doughty bought. They were never part of the Priory estate, and they had a quite separate development history, including the building of Gloucester Road and the north side of Mortlake Road. They, in fact, belong to this man. This is John Cox Dillman Engelhart. The Engelharts were other major landowners in Kew at the time, and uh, John Cox Dillman Engelhart was a miniaturist, like some of his ancestors. And this is, in fact, his self-portrait, which you can find in the National Portrait Gallery. Now, on the yellow part, Miss Doughty proceeded to build her famous priory. It was never, in fact, a priory, and it was never intended to be lived in. And she cited it, in fact, for reasons best known to herself, more or less down in the bottom right-hand corner of the fields that she had purchased. And this is a, a diagram of the Priory from 1820. It was never intended to be lived in. This is by the architect John Papworth. And it shows that it consisted simply of a kitchen and scullery, a dining room, a drawing room, a library, and a small chapel. What it was, was in fact a sort of summer house. And around it, Papworth uh, had the grounds uh, laid out in a pleasing manner with the construction of a small lake, ornamental lake, uh, roughly speaking, where today's Forest Road is. And this was Miss Doughty's getaway, if you like. She was very wealthy and she lived 
during part of the year in a house in Bedford Row. Uh, she owned other houses in Bedford Row that she rented out. And she had a lovely house at the top of Richmond Hill, in which she presumably lived during the summer. And when the heat and the flies and the tourists in Richmond got too much for her, she could get in her carriage and clip-clop down the road to Kew and sit in her summer house and enjoy the land around her. So the priory then was never a priory. It was never inhabited during her lifetime. Uh, and I'm not, in fact, going to talk more about it or very much more about her, because there are two good articles that have been published in our society's journal. And if you're interested, I strongly recommend either of those as further reading. What instead I am going to talk about is what happened to the estate when Miss Doughty died in 1826 up until 1875. Uh, what happened after 1875 with the ownership of the land and early building on it? What then drove the red brick development of the estate, which gave us most of what we know today as the Priory Estate? And something about the architect called Herbert Bignold, uh, who designed much of the red brick estate. So let's start with Miss Doughty's death in 1826. She had a problem. This is the first page of her will. It stretches in all 10 pages, including four codicils. And I have transcribed it all and given a copy of the transcript to the Richmond Local Studies Library. And if you want to know what's in the will, I strongly recommend that you go and have a look at the transcript rather than struggling with the original. But her problem was that she had lots and lots of assets and she had nobody to, lend, uh, to leave them to because she was the last of the line of the Doughty's. Uh, her father and grandfather had become very wealthy, building much of what we know as today's Bloomsbury, and uh, she had had a brother, but he died before his father did. And so she inherited all of the Doughty estates, which included, it might be said, the family home in Lincolnshire with its surrounding estates, uh, some land in Berkshire, parts of Bloomsbury, and uh, her house in Richmond, and so on and so forth. She, so she had really a lot of assets to apportion. What she eventually decided to do was to leave them to another old established Catholic family, the Titchbourne family, who lived in Hampshire. And this wasn't quite as uh, bizarre as might seem, because her grandfather, George Brownlow Doughty, had married a Tichborne. And Sir Henry Tichborne, the seventh baronet to whom she left her estates, was in fact her second cousin. Now, in point of fact, the land didn't pass to Sir Henry because she died before she did, she did uh, leading to one of the codicils in the will. The land eventually passed to his third son, Edward Tichborne, the ninth baronet. And uh, Edward Tichborne inherited these lands on condition in Miss Doughty's will that he change his name to Doughty so that the name would be perpetuated. Well, this he duly did. He became known as Sir Edward Tichborne-Doughty largely, I think, to get his hands on the money. Um, and he owned the what had been the Priory Estates in Kew from Miss Doughty's death onwards until his own death in 1853. And the Tichborns, remember, lived down in Hampshire. So they didn't actually do very much to the uh, Priory Estate. They were content to continue letting it out to tenant farmers. And the only thing that we think they did do uh, 
was that they either extended or rebuilt the priory itself so that it could be lived in. They built a wing on the side of it, it appears, so that it had some bedrooms and was then rented out as a gentleman's residence. Uh, and we know that this was certainly the case by 1841 because the 1841 census records that there was somebody living there. Now, uh, there's, uh, this is uh, all fine until Sir Edward Tichborne dies when the land passes to his brother James. And James held the land also apparently without doing very much to it until he died in 1862. And this is when the problems began for the Priory estate, because the land should have passed to this man, whose photograph you see here, his eldest son, Roger. But Roger had gone off on a round-the-world trip. Uh, he'd gone to South America, and he was reported to have taken a boat from Rio to Cuba. And the boat, unfortunately, was lost at sea in a storm, and all hands on board are believed to have drowned. And his mother, Harriet, was so distraught with grief that she refused to believe that her son had died. And she started putting newspaper advertisements all over the place for people to send her information about what had happened to her son. And of course, it, after a year or two, the eventual happened that somebody popped up in London saying, I am Sir Roger Charles Tichborne and I wish to claim my estate. And his supposed mother fell on him sobbing, my dear beloved son. But the rest of the family were a bit less convinced, as this man was in fact a butcher from Wagga Wagga in Australia. And so began the famous case of the Tichborne claimant when he went to court to claim his inheritance from the Tichborne family. And this trial became a long running sensation in the middle of the 1860s. And people would queue to come in and watch it or to, they would read about it in the newspaper every morning. And it employed so many lawyers and judges that it eventually effectively bankrupted the Tichborns. The Tichborns won the case and the claimant was in fact jailed for perjury, but the Tichborns were left in a parlous state. And um, this may explain part of why they didn't seem to do very much to the estate in the meanwhile. Now, there is one house on the estate, and this is it, uh, which may be a survivor from the time of the Tichborns, or even possibly of Miss Doughty. And this we know nowadays as Cecil Court, but it was previously known as Priory Lodge. And it's unclear when it was built, because uh, you may remember that in Lot 1, Miss Doughty in 1809 got a building, a house on Kew Green, it said. Well, this is not quite on Kew Green, uh, as well as the lands around it. And we know that from 1841, at least, it was there and it was inhabited and it was called Priory Lodge because it appears in the censuses. Uh, but it's unclear whether this house is actually as early as the 1800s or whether it was, in fact, knocked down and replaced with a house by the Tichborns before 1840 or possibly even after. Anyhow, um, this is the point at which the story takes a dramatic change, because in 1875, the High Court ordered that the Tichborns were to put the estate up for auction in order to raise money uh, to pay off the lawyers. And here we turn to look at who bought the estate and what did they do with it. Well, this is the auction map 
that went uh, with the 1875 auction, you'll see that the Priory estate has been split into two lots called Lot 2 and Lot 3. In case you're wondering, there was a Lot 1. It was up in Richmond. And if you look on the bottom centre, you will see that here is Miss Doughty's Priory at the bottom in red with what looks like an extension on it, which was presumably the bedrooms. And uh, this, together with the lands surrounding it, was one of the two lots. And the other was made up of two buildings, one which is just called Cottage here, and one which was Priory Lodge. Now, there's also a building here, actually on Kew Green, which was called Fairlawn Cottage. And uh, this was much older. Um, this never formed a part of the Priory estate up until 1875. But in 1875, both lots at this auction were in fact bought by the same man, a Cornish mining engineer, a retired Cornish mining engineer, called Richard Henry Mitchell, sometimes with a T in his name. And he lived in Hammersmith uh, with his wife, where he owned some other property. And presumably his intention was to buy the Priory estate in order to develop it. In fact, the next year he bought Fairlawn Cottage, and so it did then, in 1876, become part of the Priory estate. Uh, but as we'll see, it didn't survive very long. Now, it's not known what Mr. Mitchell's plans exactly were, uh, and he may not have had enough resources on his own to uh, do the development of the whole estate. Because two years after this auction in 1877, he put parts of the estate up for auction again. And this is the map from that auction in 1877. And you will see that in this auction, the Priory itself, uh, surrounded by a fairly small plot of land, formed one lot in this auction. And Priory Lodge, together with Fairlawn Cottage and some stables, formed the other lots in the auction. But the rest of the land was still in the possession of Mr. Mitchell, including what we'd previously seen as Cottage, but is now Priory Park House. And this is, in fact, a fairly good uh, indication that the area as a whole was known as Priory Park at that time. Now, unfortunately, we don't know who bought each of these lots and indeed who eventually bought the bits that weren't up at this auction. But we do know who built lot number one. And that I'm going to show you because that is directly the history of the Priory and its successor itself. And so uh, one thing Mr. Mitchell had done before he put this, these lots up for auction was he had built on the north side an embankment around this estate. And this was in fact quite a good idea because uh, this was low-lying land, it was prone to flooding, and that was of course not a very good idea if you were going to build houses on it. So anyway, let's see what happened to lot one. That's the lot with the priory in the bottom right-hand corner. This is transcribed from the lease of something called May's Villa, uh, which was built, in fact, roughly on the site of the old priory. And it records the land ownership of lot one from 1875 onwards. As we know, in 1875, Richard Henry Mitchell had bought the whole lot. And in 1877, at the second auction, it appears that lot one was, built, uh, was bought by somebody called Clarence Smith, a stockbroker in the city. Now, he didn't, in fact, own it for very long, because two years later, 
he sold it to a man called Michael McSheehan, a property speculator from Dublin. And it's probable that Mr. McSheehan was the first person who seriously began trying to develop the estate. But not everything was uh, happy for Mr. McSheehan. He had some financial problems. And the next year, for example, he had to bring in a man called William Settles um, to part own this lot with him. And William Settles then inconveniently died shortly afterwards. Uh, and his estate was then administered as co-owner by a solicitor called Edward Stone. Um, the most significant on this uh, progression of owners here is in fact the next one, a man called John Joseph Hickmott, uh, who came into possession of this part of the estate in 1881. And he was a timber merchant from Mile End. So once again, somebody who had nothing to do with Q. Just for completeness, uh, down at the bottom, we see that in uh, about that time, 1881 or so, uh, Mr. Hickmott brought in a builder called Giles Bennett, who knocked down the priory and on top of it built what was called, first of all, May's Villa and now May's Lodge, um, and who also built, in fact, the uh, houses on the south side of what is nowadays May's Road. And then May's Villa was then uh, the lease to May's Villa was sold in 1883 to a man called Thomas Bernard Wilkins. So this gives us an idea of what happened to the estate uh, ownership over time, but it doesn't follow that the other parts of the estate had the same ownership pattern. Anyhow, what I'd like to do is just look briefly at Mr. McSheehan as the first man to try and seriously develop the estate. And Mr. McSheehan, in fact, had grand plans. If you go to the Surrey History Centre, you can find a number of designs filed under his name, including, for example, this rather splendid freestanding villa and another detached villa and some rather charming variations on designs for semi-detached cottages. But unfortunately, these designs have no supporting documentation. So we don't know who the architect was, we don't know when they were drawn up, and we don't know which parts of the estate they were going to be built on. But one thing we do know is that in fact, none of them ever got built because Mr. McSheehan ran into problems. At about this time, he had bought a plot of land in Southwark, on Southwark Street, and he was building these rather splendid warehouses on it, which survive to the present day. And in order to do this, he had borrowed money. But unfortunately, by about 1880, he found he wasn't able to pay the mortgage. And he defaulted on the mortgage and was duly sued. And if you want to read the details, they're in the London Metropolitan Archives under something called the Beresford Haywood Estate. And so he was forced to go cap in hand to various other people to try to raise money to stave off bankruptcy. And it seems that one of the people that he turned to was none other than John Joseph Hickmott, who I've just mentioned. And when Mr. Hickmott lent him money against the security of the lands in Kew, uh, he promptly found himself being joined in action as uh, a defendant along with Mr. McSheehan. I doubt that this bothered Mr. Hickmott very much as he was evidently quite a tough character. Anyway, Mr. McSheehan lost. Uh, he then forfeited his lands in Kew, which passed to Mr. Hickmott. And this is where the real story of the building of the estate begins. Because uh, it's clear that from about 1880, 1881 onwards, 
Mr. Hickmott began serious efforts to build houses on the Priory estate. And this was, in fact, one of the first houses that was built under his tenure. Those of you who know the area will recognise this, this is the first house on the north side of Priory Road as you enter the estate from Kew Green. You can see Kew Pond in front of it. Rather lovely house. And very fortunately, the deeds for this house survive. And here they are. And we can see this is a deed of um, a, a leasehold indenture made in 1883 when the finished house was leased out for the first time. And it shows us that John Joseph Hickmott was the freeholder, that Christopher Gibbs White of Clarence Road, Gunnersbury, was the builder, and that the house was sold to a man called William Henry Gibbs of the Cedars Estate, West Kensington, civil engineer. Well, he, in fact, was not just a civil engineer. He was, in fact, building the West Kensington estate at this time. And it's in a way a bit odd that he should want to buy a house in Kew. And in fact, he never lived in it because shortly afterwards, in about 1885, his company that was building the West Kensington estate, as it is today, went bust. And so, in fact, he never lived in Kew. But there was a, a certain amount of other building going on on the estate, and we'll look just quickly at that. Uh, the earliest part of the building involved the knocking down of Fairlawn Cottage, which was probably in 1879, and its replacement by six terraced houses, which were known as Priory Park Terrace. They are nowadays just numbered as part of the Kew Green. And we know that these were finished by uh, late 1880, because there was a newspaper advertisement advising that they were now available for rent. At the same time, the houses, the first houses, numbers one to uh, nine on Priory Road on the north side were being built by Clarence uh, White. And uh, on the south side of the road next to Priory Lodge, somebody was building numbers four to 14, as they now are. Uh, and if anybody watching is uh, living in one of these houses and has got their original deeds, I would dearly love to see them. And then the fourth thing that was going on, as I've mentioned, was the demolition of the Priory by Giles Bennett and the building of Mays Villa and the south side only of Mays Road, uh, where the first occupants are recorded in the local directory in 1884. And all of these buildings, in fact, have leases that run from 1881. So in the early 1880s, there was a great flurry of development of the estate. And it's worth pointing out here, you'll notice that all of these buildings are built in completely different styles. Uh, they were all built, as far as we know, by different builders. And this was, in fact, to be a recurring pattern of the estate. And so in the early 1880s, what we had, in essence, were the six houses here that were Priory Park Terrace, the early houses on the north side of Priory Road, the houses numbers 4 to 14 on the south side, and then where the Priory itself had been was Mays Villa and the uh, houses on the south side of Mays Road. And rather oddly, there were these uh, 61 to 67 um, Priory Road which is obviously built by the same people as 1 to 9, uh, but was essentially built in the middle of nowhere. Notice also that Priory Park House is still in existence at this date, 
And notice here that uh, Priory Lodge has been mislabeled as the Priory. And this is just to show you, this is taken, in fact, from the Ordnance Survey map of 1893. It's just to show you that even the Ordnance Survey sometimes made mistakes because this was not the Priory and never was. It was instead Priory Lodge. And then there appears to have been a bit of a pause. And the reason for this is that in the 1880s, Britain was going through a period of depression and the uh, building market in general was depressed and activity didn't really pick up again until the end of the decade. Uh, by that time, very fortunately for us, the London Borough of Richmond had come into being in 1890 and they had appointed a borough surveyor, and the borough surveyor had decreed that anybody building a house from now on was required to submit a planning application. And so from about 1890, in fact, slightly earlier, uh, there are a whole series of planning applications for new building on the Priory estate. And this is a list of some of them. And one thing to notice about them is I've listed them here with the builder, first of all, and then the architect. And you will notice that most of the applications came from a builder called Ladbrook, and quite a number were associated with the architect I mentioned at the beginning, Herbert Bignold. But a number of them were not like, for example, these houses on the north side of Priory Road. And uh, moreover, these applications are spread over quite a period of time. And this was a time from the 1880s onwards when fashions in architecture had been moving on. And to show this, let's take a little imaginary walk down Priory Road uh, starting just past the first houses, which I've shown you, the pond house, and see what we call the development of the red brick estate. And so the first set of houses that we come to are these. Uh, they were designed by John Hume of Turnham Green, and they were built by a builder called William Terry, who it turns out came from Canterbury. And these, of course, are in a quite different style from the Pond House. I think these are rather lovely houses. Look at the beautiful ironwork up on the balcony there and the rather nice decoration over the uh, porch. Well, if we continue walking down the road, uh, we pass this group of houses we suddenly come to a completely different style of house, and that is this one. Uh, this is built, or this is designed, only a year after, uh, but it's very much a house of the 1890s. And this is, in fact, the first style of house to be built by um, the builder, Mr. Ladbrook, and to be designed by the architect, Herbert Bignold. And these are very characteristically 1890s houses with uh, the terracotta plaques between the ground and first floor and the divided window panes and the upper sashes of the windows. Um, so there's something completely different. But our surprises are not at an end. If we walk a bit further down the road, we come to houses that look like this. Now, these were also designed by Mr. Bignold and built by Mr. Ladbrook, but they're in a quite different style, only five years further on. And those of you who heard an earlier talk, which I gave during the COVID lockdown, will recognize that these, you may perhaps be muttering to yourself, hmm, look a bit like what is in Lawn Crescent. And so, in fact, they do, because they've got the white wooden balconies at um, first floor level, uh, 
and the French windows giving out onto them. They have the rounded arches over the set back porches, um, which are all very uh, similar to what we see in uh, Lawn Crescent. And in fact, this is probably due to the considerable influence of the building of the Bedford Park estate in Chiswick, which had been completed a little before this and which had a great impact on architectural styles towards the end of the Victorian period. But our surprise on walking down the road doesn't end there, because if we turn round from looking at this building and look at what's on the south side of the building, we see, again, another totally different style of house. These are, in fact, Edwardian rather than Victorian. They're also built by Mr. Ladbrook. They're rather grand houses, actually. Uh, but they are designed not by Mr. Bignold, but by another architect called Albert Casse, who was originally from Kent, but by this time was living in Gunnersbury. And this is very much a uh, typical Edwardian house. And it reminds us that the development of this estate was, in fact, the work of many hands. And I'd like just to look quickly at the three most important hands in the development of at least the red brick part of the estate. And these were, of course, Mr. Hickmott, who I've mentioned, the freeholder, Alfred Henry Ladbrook, the builder, and Herbert Bignall, the architect. So let's start by looking at Mr. Hickmott. He was, as I've said, a timber merchant from Mile End. He was himself a builder, a brickmaker, a landlord, uh, all sorts of things. He, was, he had a finger in a lot of pies. He was a sort of poo bar of Mile End. Uh, very inconveniently, he also had a son who, guess what, was called John Joseph Hickmott. So it's in fact impossible to tell which of the two was primarily involved in the building of the estate in Kew. In fact, they probably collaborated on it together, as needless to say, the son went into the father's business and they weren't kind enough to distinguish themselves as the elder and the younger. So we just have to regard them as one for these purposes. But whoever they were, they were pretty determined. This is the signature of John Joseph Hickmott from 1883. That's from the bottom of the lease indenture that I showed you earlier. And that's a pretty determined signature. So the Hickmots didn't take no for an answer. Now, it was probably the Hickmots who brought in the builder, Alfred Ladbrook. He again had nothing to do with Kew. He was born in Essex. He'd married a lady called Alice Jarvis, and they had settled in Wandsworth. And they lived in Wandsworth from 1875 on to about 1880, uh, sorry, 1888. And it was in 1888 that the family moved to Kew when evidently Alfred Ladbrook, the elder, was given the job of building the Priory estate. And he was only aged 37 at the time. And the building of the Priory estate may quite fairly be said to be his life's work. They lived at various different places around the estate while it was being built. And he eventually died in Kew in 1924. Now, the architect, Herbert Bignold, was also a foreigner, if one may put it that way, born in Norfolk. Uh, he was the grandson of a rather prominent mayor of Norwich, and in fact, the great grandson of the founder of Norwich Union. Uh, but he was the sixth son of a farmer. He didn't have pots of family money. And so he had to go out and earn his living. And this indeed he did after training as an architect. He moved to London 
and he married a lady called Lydia Ann Banks, and they settled in Wandsworth. And this is more than a coincidence, um, because it's almost certain that it was in Wandsworth at this time in the 1880s that uh, Mr. Bignold, who had worked up an architectural practice of his own uh, on Lavender Hill, 242 Lavender Hill, which is now a Kentucky Fried Chicken, I think, um, uh, this is almost certainly where he became known to or possibly got to know uh, Alfred Ladbrook, the builder. And so it was that Ladbrook brought him in to design the various houses on the uh, estate in Kew. But he had a vigorous practice of his own, and things went up and down for him. Uh, he was made bankrupt at least twice, and uh, his career came to an end in 1910. The last uh, buildings that I can find that are designed by him, which don't survive anymore, uh, were built in 1910, and he then died in Suffolk. He re retired to Suffolk and was out of the picture after 1910. And so let's look at what he designed. Um, this is the earliest building I can find, which is on Fourth Bridge Road in Clapham. It's a row of terraced houses, quite nice terraced houses, actually. I actually think they're much sought after even today. But in architectural terms, nothing really sort of mold breaking about the design. Not very long after, he was busy designing these houses, which I've already pointed out to you, on Priory Road. In 1895, he renovated this building in Fulham. Nothing to do with Mr. Ladbrook, but he renovated it to great acclaim. The year later, here he is building the lawn terrace knockoff, if you like, in Priory Road for Mr. Labrook. The following year, he designed these terraced houses extending Forest Road, and they're rather similar to the earlier ones I showed you in Clapham. Uh, but then in, he was also independently designing, for example, these rather splendid double-fronted houses on King's Road in Richmond. Again, nothing to do with Mr. Ladbrook. This was in combination with another builder. This was part of his continuing architectural practice. In 1901, he built this remarkable house on Thurley Road in Wandsworth, in fact, the tower on the side of it is a little bit later. It's a couple of years after the main house. Uh, but this was, again, a very dramatically different style of house. In the same year, he built this rather eclectic block of flats in Wandsworth. Uh, a couple of years later, he designed a rectory in Lowestoft. Notice that it's got a tower on the side of it. And the following year, these flats in Wandsworth, also with a tower on the corner. And then in 1906, he designed the last house in the north side of Mays Road, 29 Mays Road. I'm fairly sure that he also designed the other houses on the north side of Mays Road, at roughly speaking, that time, 1905, 1906. Um, but this was the last house that he designed for the Priory estate, as far as we know. And goodness me, he's got a turret on the side of it, which was rather a trademark of his by the 1900s. And then the last buildings I found, the surviving buildings, uh, that he designed in London before retiring were in fact these semi-detached houses on an estate in North London. And those are again of a simpler style. So now that I've shown you that, you'll be able to walk down any street and point and say, yep, 
that's a big knoll. I recognize it anywhere. It's got his fingerprints all over it. Except that, of course, you wouldn't, because as is very evident, Mr. Bignold didn't go in for a style of his own. He was very happy to build whatever the builder wanted or whatever fashion dictated or would sell. And so apart from a certain fondness for towers by 1900, uh, there isn't anything very much that would tell us uh, that this house was built, was designed by Mr. Bignold. And so just looking very briefly uh, in a flashback, what we see is the f different phases of the building estate uh, is that the Priory estate in the early 1880s uh, with the pink houses, then by uh, about 1890, we'd had most of Priory Road, all of Haverfield Gardens, for which unfortunately there's no documentation. Then by about 1901, the census shows that Bushwood Road had been completed, and so had the north side of Priory Road. And oddly enough, four little houses on the west side of Mays Road. And just for completeness, I should tell you, these are nothing to do with Mr. Ladbrook. They were built by a man uh, called Stephen Nicklin, uh, who in fact lived in... Doughty Lodge, which is this little house here, while he was building them, and then eventually moved to Twickenham, I think it was. And so there again, nothing to do with Ladbrook. And then in the last phase, uh, the houses making up the south side of Bushwood Road, the northernmost part of Forest Road, the southern part of Priory Road, and the north side of Mays Road were built. And notice that the north side of Mays Road was built some 25 years after the south side of it. So it's not in fact surprising that it looks completely different. So what we have is, if you like, a time capsule of changing architectural fashions over a period of about 25 years. And as we've seen, that's because these various houses were built by a whole variety of different builders here in boldface and designed by a variety of different architects. Some of them we don't know about for sure, including Priory Lodge and 4 to 14 Priory Road. But most of what we see from 1890 onwards uh, the face, if you like, of the Priory estate as it is today was designed mostly by Herbert Bignold and built by Alfred Ladbrook. And these are the two gentlemen to whom we really owe the public face of the estate today. And I'd like to close just by thanking three people who very kindly allowed me to see the original deeds for their houses. Uh, and this in turn allowed me to construct the chronology of building that I told you about in this talk.